Thank you for being here. I'm aware there's a lot going on. I'm Morella Lascarain and I'm a medical doctor and I'm here to tell you that there is no such thing as a purely physical illness. Mm -hmm. Now this might come as the obvious to you guys, but in the medical world is a bit of a blasphemy, of course. And so I first would need to tell you why I got into that idea. Unfortunately, the abbreviation of my talk, um, it's called um, from changing stories from lead to gold. And this bit that was missing in that thing was to heal sick bodies. So this is all about healing sick bodies. So that, that's what I strongly believe. There's no such thing as a purely physical illness. So my story begins when I was in third year of medical school. And um, after doing two years of theoretical subjects, we were finally released into the hospital to gather our medical history. And so the, the task consisted in, in, in finding a willing victim who would sit with us for two hours in, to fill the form. And so the lady who agreed to do this exercise with me was in her mid-40s, she had four children, and she, had a, she was hospitalized, receiving dialysis, she had lupus. And um, after gathering her biographical data, as you would, I asked her the typical um, doctor question, which is, you know, tell me how it all started. Now, normally when you ask that question to patients, they start telling you about a series of symptoms, right? But this lady didn't go there. For some mysterious reason, she told me, the psychological story that was in the background of her condition. And it went like this. She was married with four children, and one day her husband lived, lived with someone, and she was lived with the children, no money, no job, no skills. And so she gave, had to get herself together and, um, and go out there and get two jobs to make enough money to pay the bills for the four children, leave the children with her mom looking after them, and it was very, very tough. And so after, as, as the one year went by of this process, she, she got angrier and angrier, and her anger grew from her husband to all men, to the point where she would be enraged any time that she would have an encounter with a man. And as she grew angrier and angrier and angrier, she started eating in order to appease that anger, and so she ended up with 30 more kilos over one year. Then she looked at herself in the mirror one morning as she was getting dressed to go to work, and she looked at herself, 30 kilos bigger, and she said, you're disgusting. You look like a frog. And she started croaking, <laughs> literally croaking. Quack, quack, quack. One week later, she started manifesting. This is one of the many, many symptoms of lupus. It's called discoid lupus. She got covered in discoid lupus, which are black patches of lesions that never truly heal. They leave you with scarring. So by the time I saw this lady, and this was like four years down the track, she was full of either black spots or scars of the spots where the, the discoid had been. Now this lady knew that she was dying. And she knew that she was dying because of that anger that she didn't know how to release. I was in third year of med school. I took that story, shoved it under the carpet, as you do, because it didn't fit with anything else that I was studying, and I left it there. So I finished med school, I went on to do um, orthopedic surgery training, and when I was 28 or 29, out of you know, lack of sleep, bad food, terrible relationships, I mean, that's what you do if you've got 24 hours shifts every four days, right? Uh, one day I decided, oh my God, if I spend another day in the hospital, I think I'm gonna die. And so I decided to quit medicine and I went to Paris to study filmmaking, as you do. Of <laughs> <laughs> oh, course. And so it was about eight, nine months into my, my experience in Paris where I go to film school with a bunch of 21-year-olds, right? And I'm like 29 and I've worked as a doctor for a few years now, like five years. And um, so the, the experience wasn't, it was fantastic. It was liberating, it was a completely different life, but it was quite lonely, right? To say the least. And one morning I wake up like, 
covered in this rash. This is pictures that I gathered from the internet to remotely look like what I looked like. It was much worse than that. I couldn't open my eyes. My eyelids were so swollen and my hands were swollen as well. And it was in the middle of the winter. So literally the little bits of me that you could see were monster-like. So I took myself to the hospital. I had already gone through my brain through what possibilities it could be. It could be photosensitivity reaction, it could be contact dermatitis with all the product, you know, soaps or whatever I was using, my face and my hands. Okay, I don't know what it is. Anyway, so I go to the hospital, they go through the same questionnaires that I've already done for myself. They don't know that I speak French. They assume that I don't. Sorry, yeah, that, uh, no, sorry, that, uh, it wasn't, I did speak French, what they didn't know was that I was a doctor, because I didn't put it in my form, I was a student. And, um, and so anyway, I get the medical <coughs> round, and people are, you know, all the dermatologists are discussing the case, and blah, 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 and of course they start talking lupus. It's one of the possibilities for the sensitivity reactions in lupus. So I get prescribed what you usually do in these cases, steroids and antihistamines, sit home, come back in three days, and we'll see how you go. The worst three days, I mean, no sleep, the itching was horrendous. After the three days, I come back, nothing has changed. Oh, up the, you know, up the dose, another three days and nothing has happened. By the end of the sixth day, I'm like literally desperate because nothing has changed. I've had all the treatments. And I remember my frog lady, my dear frog lady. And so I got myself into a quarter of my apartment and I asked myself, what does this mean? And it, it, suddenly the veil dropped and it was like, of course, this is a red flag. You're telling humanity, hey, I'm here. Connect with me. The little bits of me that were visible on that winter in Paris were the little bits that were bright red and swollen. And so I entered the subway and people were giving me their seats. And I would go to the bakery and the lady would say, would you mademoiselle, which before she was <laughs> ignoring me completely. So that, that rash, it allowed me somehow to connect to people. Now that happened on a Thursday evening and by Saturday morning I had nothing. So, for the next year, the following year, every time I would get stressed or anxious, I would notice a tingling here. And this is the area of the malar rash that happens in lupus as well. And so I was particularly concerned thinking, oh my God, I think I already caused this photosensitivity reaction. I might cause myself a lupus as well. So back then, I went back home. I'm from Venezuela originally. I live in New Zealand now. I went back home and I talked to the only person back then who I knew was into my body health, a doctor, a pediatrician. And I said, you know what? I'm so concerned I'm going to cause myself a lupus. And she looked at me, she said, Marina, if you can cause yourself a lupus, why don't you just uncause it? And the, I don't know what that statement did to me. It was like the penny dropped, never again. I never hit the matter rash again. So, of course, I became obsessed with mind body medicine. I started de reading Deepak Chopra, Left to Right, um, Louise Hay. I mean, whatever I could come across, I was reading mind body health. I moved to New Zealand after I never made films. That's destiny for you. I ran into a New Zealander in a bar and whoop, ended up in New Zealand. By pure chance, the first time in my life that I have to look for a job, I opened the newspaper. I opened a newspaper and this natural, natural um, therapies college is looking for a tutor of medical subjects. Anatomy, physiology, pathology, diagnosis, pharmacology, blah, blah, blah. So that's what I did. And of course, after three years in there, I decided to set up an integral health center, which I have to this day, so it was 14 years ago. And um, so where we gather the doctors and the nurses and the osteopaths and the acupuncturists and the naturopaths and so on, there's about 15 of us. In that process of, I did have to become a businesswoman in that moment, but I always had the thing about, oh, what? I want to see clients again, but I don't want to be a doctor. It doesn't interest me at all. And I had this mind-body thing going, how, how do I go into that world? And then Bruce Lipton, have you had the opportunity to see him Personally, anyone with that luck, the most amazing speaker you're going to see in your life. So try to do it. Now, we're lucky in that Bruce adores New Zealand and he spends probably two months a year over there. So we have regular talks with Bruce Lipton. Now, Bruce is a cellular biologist who back in the 80s was working with stem cells. And he noticed that 
you know, back then, this is the 80s, guys, so it's the, gene, the genes are the masters, the supreme commanders of reality, right? Um, and so the idea was that whatever is in your genes, that's it. But Bruce was working in a lab where if he had these cells were all, all have the same DNA, and they're supposed to be all the same, if he put, a, to put them in a culture dish with some you know, liquid with different vitamins or different elements, they would turn into a muscle cell. And then the same kind, he would put them in another petri dish and change the environment and add some other cofactors and whatever, they would turn into a bone cell. It's like, hold on, this, and this is what happens in the body. We'll come from a single cell and then the cells divide and eventually they differentiate into our liver and our brain and our muscles in the arm and her, even your toenails. So how does that happen? They all have the same DNA. And so he started thinking, oh, it's actually not the genes that are important, it's the environment. Huh. And then he, this is very important, his next step in thinking was, what is the environment in a human body? Well, it's all these liquids that bathe all, all of our cells. But then at the time, again in the 80s, it was Candace Pert who was writing about the molecules of emotion for the first time. And she was saying, well, if you're scared, there's this rush of neurotransmitters that go into, down your nerves and that those are released all, all over your body. Not only that, there's also the hormones. You've got the adrenaline, you've got the cortisol, you've got everything that makes you feel scared. And so all these substances are circulating in these liquids telling the cells what to do. So Bruce thought, well, in that, in that environment is where you find those molecules of emotions. But where do the emotions come from? And so he thought, well, hold on. Let's look at a boy with a dog. If the dog has previously, sorry, the boy has had a previous experience with a dog that was scary, his next reaction with a dog will be fear. But if this boy had a previous experience of a loving relationship with a dog, the next encounter with a dog is going to be lovely. Therefore, the only difference with boy, between boy one and boy two is their belief systems. Dogs are scary or dogs are lovely. And that will determine what gets released throughout the body and that will determine what the cells would do. And he called his book, if you haven't read this book, you have to read this book, The Biology of Belief. It's a tiny book. For me, it's one of the seminal books in mind body medicine. That will determine what the cell will do. Will it grow? Will it function properly? Or is it going to, <clears throat> we have to prepare ourselves for danger. And so when you live in that state of, danger, of, of, of perception of danger, there's no way that you can grow. There is all sorts of malfunctions. So it's one of my, he slides that I like the most. You know, if you were in a, it, it, love and fear are not compatible. Love and fear are not compatible. When, you're, when the cells are in love, and he called the cellular love, things like the right nutrients and the right atmosphere, they're going to growth. When they're in fear, they're going to protection. And this is something he could see under the microscope, right? So I went to that talk, and for the first time, after reading all these books on mind-body medicine, I had something concrete, because Bruce also talks about the power of the subconscious mind. It's all in the subconscious. So if you can change your beliefs at a subconscious level, then you've got a chance of healing. What happened next is that I got, my, I got all excited. Okay, that's it. I'm going to be a belief coach. I'm going to help people change their beliefs, and that'll be it. So I trained in a number of techniques in order to change people's beliefs, and I started getting a lot of anxieties and depressions and so on. Not necessarily aiming at, I am going to help you with your back pain, because it wasn't what I was looking for, but I did get clients who had physical stuff, and they resolved, as they resolved their mental conflicts. One day in 2010, this is the case that completely shifted everything, I get this 34-year-old mom, <coughs> who comes into my consult room, don't ask me why, I haven't got a clue. She had a Durker veins stenosynovitis. So it's an inflammation of this thing that over here, where she couldn't do this, right? And she had a four month old baby and whenever she went to change her nappies or change her dress, she would have excruciating pain. And had been, sorry, the baby was seven months old and she had had it for four months. And 
She had been to multiple physiotherapy sessions, she had had three steroid injections, and she was in line to see the orthopedic surgeon the week after my consult. Nothing was working. So she was treated by the physio as an overuse syndrome. This woman was right-handed and the, the problem was on the left hand. I don't know where they got the conclusion from. Anyway, so we start, I, at that moment, I was already starting to see symbols in illness. And as, as she walked into the room, I, I don't know why, I saw the hitchhiking symptom, symbol. And so I asked her, are you waiting for somebody to give you a ride? I mean, seriously, completely loopy. I thought she was going to walk out immediately. And she said, yeah, tell me about it. Well, you know, this pregnancy wasn't particularly planned. And when I got pregnant, my husband said he was going to get a much better job with better wages so I can stop working and look after the baby. And then what happened? Well, I had the baby and then he never changed the job. So therefore, three months the tr down the track, I had to stop working again. So she's a graphic designer, works from home. And then on top of that, she had to look after the baby. And so as the days passed on, she was growing more and more resentful with this guy. And she wasn't keeping quiet. Because <laughs> often when you read my book of books, they tell you that it's repressed emotions. Oh no, this woman wasn't repressed. She was berating him every day. They had an argument three times a day about the whole thing, right? It, but, okay, so at that point, obviously she had been angry with her husband for four months and nothing was changing. And I bet the more, the angrier she got, the more um, defensive he got. So I say, okay, hold on. You've got three options here. One, you can divorce him. Oh no, that's not an option. We've been together, he's lovely, it's just, you know, whatever. He's always been like that. Okay, option B, you can keep on arguing. You know, that's obviously not really working, is it? She's like, no, no, you're right. And I said, well, option C is you just step into that place where you actually, you, you're in, you are in charge of the household. And she says, well, that's actually true because that's who I am, the one who organizes the insurance and I organize the mortgage and I organize this and I organize... So it is who you are in the, in the couple, aren't you? She said, yes. Okay, well, why don't you own that thing? So we make this belief change procedure. I am in charge. 48 hours later, there was no trace of pain and she has never hit it again. And I know this because I see her every so often since 2010. That day my conventional medical paradigm, which was mind and body are separate. In medicine, not only mind and body are separate, in medicine, your thyroid has got nothing to do with your big toe, right? And your thyroid has got nothing to do with your heart. You go to a different specialist for every body part that you have. So in medicine, nothing has got connection with anything, but especially not mind and body. Two, that there are physical illnesses and mental illnesses. They're completely separate. You go to a psychiatrist for one and you go to another type of doctor for the other stuff. And number three, you would never think of going to a doctor for a physical illness so that they treat you through your mind, never. And here it was, I had just treated a tendonitis through a 20 minute belief change intervention and it worked. Now I was kaput, I was like, okay, where do I go from here? Help me. So, I started looking for mind-body programs in university. I needed something more sound, I needed to study this properly, right? To my huge surprise, after three years of looking online for programs and so on, oh my god, this shows up and it happened to be in Auckland, New Zealand, where I live. Unbelievable! So I signed up for the, this was postgraduate in mind-body health. And it was led, Brian has just retired, so he's not leading the program anymore, by Brian Broom, who's an immunologist in Auckland. Now what happened with Brian, I think he had a similar crisis to mine, and so for a, for a time, he was very interested in the mind. He knew that psychiatrists only prescribe pills, so it's not very interesting. And so he stepped out of medicine and went into psychotherapy. So he had done the whole psychotherapy training, and after he did that, life brought him back into medicine. So he, he ended up practicing immunology, but he had the psychotherapy background. And so what happens is that in his clients, he started noticing that the, the physical illness had somehow a link to the other story that the client was telling him about their personal lives. So he wrote this book, Smiley Illness and the Patient's Other Story, 
And this one in particular is very good, meaningful disease. And it's all about the meaning hiding behind illness. And so suddenly I found myself at AUT University surrounded by physiotherapists, osteopaths, doctors, psychotherapists, and so on. And we're all working on that idea that mind and body are one, that there's such a thing called a somatic metaphor. A metaphor. My frog lady was manifesting a metaphor. She hated herself, she berated herself, she was disgusting, she was a frog, she presented with these spotty things. There was a, another term, symbolic illness, meaningful disease, story. So this is what I did for three years. So one of the cases in um, Brian's book talks about a lady with scleroderma. Scleroderma is a severe connective tissue illness where your skin becomes thickened and gross and, and shiny, tout. And it gets to the point where you can, you know, the tips of your fingers self-amputate. It's so bad. So this woman started presenting scleroderma in her 60s, and it was getting progressively worse. And then when he asked her one of his questions, which is, when did this start? She, she said, oh, nothing special. Come on, the, you know, I'll run the time of mine. And then she came up with a story, which was she, she had been in the supermarket, and she tripped, and she face planted. And so she had, like, scratches and whatever, and she was in her 60s, probably, probably not feeling quite in her abilities anymore. Anyway, her words were, I went into my shell <laughs> and started presenting scleroderma. She gradually did, recovered, and she recovered not, Brian is really honest in the sense, he's not due to me. One of her good friends decided to gradually take her out of the house and bring her back into her friends and her relationships, and that's how she started getting better. So wow, suddenly I have found somebody in the academic world who has written books and written um, articles on this. And so for me, I started going more into this world where illness is symbolic. And where somatic metaphor is a real thing. And the more, the more I have opened my eyes to the fact that these illnesses are just the, the a body that has no verbal language symbolically manifesting everything else that's going on, the more I see it. And so I work with story. So what is the story? The story is the, the, the meaning or the interpretation that we make of our life within. So we tell ourselves a story and we convince ourselves that that's the only truth. And we keep running the same story over and over again. In that story, you can extract the symbol and it's what's represented in the body. So if you can imagine this man, I don't know what happened to him in childhood, but he looks pretty angry to me, right? And so he's carrying that story of this happened to me and injustice and anger and I hate my parents or whatever it was that happened. But you can imagine that for these men's words are probably not very kind, yeah? And his relations are probably quite difficult. And if you can imagine the constant anger in a body, I don't know if you can guess any illness that's, that can manifest. Heart disease. Heart disease could be one, yeah. lower back pain, very common, Lyons. yeah. Lyons. Could be liver, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you start seeing how human beings are multidimensionals and we cannot just separate one aspect from the other where the physical is one thing, completely dissociated from the mental, completely dissociated from the emotion. It's all one thing. We're coherent beings, we're congruent. And all these different aspects, all these different dimensions happen at the same time. And so that idea that lies in the mind-body world, which is your mind causes your body to be whatever, no, they happen at the same time. They're co-emergent. So you can't really stop, you know, oh, I'm gonna keep my thoughts this way and my body that way, because it doesn't happen that way, right? So it looks a bit like that. The story is core, it's core, it's essential. It's what binds all the aspects together. And you can see that the body is here, the words are here, the relationships are here. The spiritual um, world is here. I see a lot of people writing stuff. Do you want me to sing you all this? <laughs> uh, the other thing, before I forget, I have a series of videos that I created for, for clients or for anyone who st wants to start their self-healing. It's five chapters, free for all. Please put your name and I'll sign you up. And um, because you're here, you also get the presentation. So what do you need, our name and email? Yeah. So anyway, this is what I do in my practice now. I call, I'll call it narrative, well, I actually call it narrative hypnotherapy because in this circle, alchemy is a beautiful thing, but you try going to the doctors with alchemy, it's not the same thing, right? 
So what, basically what I do in my work is I look for what's the storyline behind the symptoms. We examine that story and we shift the meaning of the story so that now that the story is different, therefore the thoughts are going to be different, the language is going to be different, the relationships are going to be different, and therefore their physicality is going to be different as well. So, and this is the part that you can use in your practice. So, unveiling the basics. So, I've done this now, I've probably been in the symbol world for about 12 years, but you don't need to do it for 12 years. This is very simple. I'm going to show you, I think it's four questions that I have included in this particular um, presentation. So, the first question to ask your clients when they come with a physical illness is, so what was happening at the time when this started? What was happening that was emotional, traumatic, memorable? Um, eventful and very often people say nothing because in their minds you know the fact that they tripped over in the supermarket and face plant it has got nothing to do with scleroderma obviously but you keep digging you say come on there must be something or a typical clue would be if somebody says it started five weeks ago but what was happening at the time and they say I don't know well there's a reason why their subconscious knows that it happens five weeks ago and it could be something that haven't connected at all. And I give an example, I was in a, in a presentation like this and I asked for somebody from the public and she had this pinky finger, it was really hurting. And again, she had been to the physio a number of times and so on. And I said, you know, how long has it been going on? Oh, for six weeks. And what happened six weeks ago? <sighs> Nothing really that I can think of. Come on, there must be something six weeks ago. And she said, oh yeah, we got that, our new puppy. This little wee thing. Okay, well it turns out that the puppies were for the teenage children and she's thinking, oh the kids are going to help? Of course not. <laughs> so she ended up being in charge of the puppy, you know, toilet train with the puppy, the puppy, the puppy, she was up to here with the puppy, right? So often people won't tell you straight away, you know, can't lick it straight away, but you keep digging, you'll find something. The second clue is the use of language. And so this is very interesting and I started noticing very early on. People will use language in a way that, that, that connects to their body. That's why. why. Where does this come from? Because we experience the world through our senses. So if you experience your mother-in-law as a pain in the neck, then guess what you're going to have? <laughs> so, and, and people use this all the time. I carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. It, these expressions come from somewhere, so we all experience the world in a particular body part and that's usually where the tension starts accumulating, that's usually when you end up presenting symptoms. So I'll give you an example, this was astounding for me, I saw this man only once, he was one of these tough guys and his girlfriend decided that he had to come to me to control anxiety because he was undergoing cancer treatment. So I only saw him once and then he moved on, it wasn't his thing to do. But he was 34, fourth, first case of colon cancer in the family. And um, at the time, I was doing, doing a lot of body talk. You weren't familiar with that, so you do a lot of muscle testing, you go back to a memory, and so I said, oh, okay, here, boom, there's a memory at the age of 12. What is it about? And it's like, no, I'm not 12, no, nah, no, nah. we had a happy childhood. And then they said, oh, okay, I haven't thought about this for a long time when I was 12. I was coming back from school on my bike, and then my uncle pulled over, and he said, you have to come home immediately. Your sister has been run over by a car, and she's dead. I was 12. And so I said, how did you experience that? And he said, it was a kick in the guts. Hmm. Then I keep on muscle testing him and I get to 17. I said, there's another memory here and it's quite traumatic. And he says, no, well, no, you know, completely shut down bloke, kind of, no, I don't experience anything. And so he said, uh, well, what happened at 17 was that he had his, his high school sweetheart that were together and she fell pregnant. <coughs> But the parents didn't want her to have the baby, and so they, they convinced her to have an abortion, and they sent her away, so she wouldn't be with him anymore. How did you feel about that? I was gutted. So in that one hour session, the two episodes that were quite traumatic that he could relate to me, Wells had gut in their language. Third clue is what I call the tandem questions. How does this condition make you feel? And then I ask them, and what else in your life makes you feel that way? Okay? 
So this is a beautiful example. This is my lovely, lovely Bev. Bev came to me a number, couple of years ago, I think. And Bev, who's 75, 75, came with post-herpetic neuralgia, which is when you get shingles and it never goes away. So by the time she came to see me, she had been under medical treatment for about three years. She had tried morphine. She couldn't cope with the morphine. Then they put her on the GABA painting. What happened with the GABA paintings that her legs were going. She's a very active woman. She, she runs and owns a women's retreat center. And she's done it for the last 35 years. She's an amazing woman. But nothing was working. She was in pain on a scale of zero to 10 on a nine on a consistent basis. She wouldn't sleep more than an hour and a half a night. And when I asked Bev, Bev, what does that pain feel like? And she said, it's like a little man is stabbing you in the back. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> anyway, you can imagine at 75, you know, we just, she had a lot of different incidents in her life. But then at some point, I asked her, I didn't actually ask her that time. It came up spontaneously. And, and in her 40s, she had been a youth leader for a church running all the youth programs. And she was amazing, lots, you know, the, the youth just love her, a lot of people made changes and so on, but the, the, the hierarchy of the church was all patriarchal. And there was some form of consensus that they didn't like what she was doing. Maybe she was too feminine, too, I don't know what it was. Anyway, so there was this big meeting in the church with all this hierarchy, she calls it the patriarchy, and this little man in the front of the stage, that little man, <coughs> she got expelled from the church out of that meeting. And 40 years later, she ends up having this protoprotic neuralgia that stabs her in the back just like that man. That wasn't the only component of her pain. It revealed many layers of that onion, but that was so interesting. And so, oh, sorry, I'm going to skip that. So, fourth question for you guys is what does, the symbol, what does it symbolize? And here is where you have to get creative. So, I tap into everything I can have access. Things like, you know, if you can think Chinese medicine and what the organs represent, and if you do know Ayurveda, then use a little bit of that. If you know anything about biology or physiology and what each organ does, then use that. <laughs> or simply ask your client, what does liver represent to you. You never know what they're going to come up with. That's the other thing. It's not what I think, it's what they think. By the way, for example, the hitchhiking sign in the Middle East means something completely different. It's the F word. So it wouldn't be the same if I had hit a, an Arabic client. So what does the condition symbolize? So I'm going to give you a moment to guess. This is not her, this is very similar, actually, my client was much worse than that. She was a type of patient who sits in the reception and she's like covered and everybody's trying to look but not look. So she was 28 and it's the worst case of rosacea I've seen in my life. It's, it looks like acne but multiplied by 50. And she, she was difficult to look at. And so guess what symbol can lie behind that? Question to you. Embarrassed? Embarrassed? Yes. It was a story of shame. That's what it was. So she was the daughter of lawyer and doctor. And I think growing up, she was like the academic star of her school, but she also had an artistic side of her. And so when she came out of high school, she said, I want to go into fine arts. And the parents said, no, no, you're never, never going to make a living and so on. She did do fine arts. But then I think she ran out of steam, and so she really never went into being successful in the fine arts world. And she just walked around with this mask of shame at 28, holding little jobs here and there, not feeling quite successful. And she, she actually moved, uh, she was American, she had moved out of America to not have to deal with her parents. Mm -hmm. And she was living in New Zealand. 58 year old with vaginismus. Do you know what vaginismus is? It's an involuntary contraction of the vagina. Therefore, you can't have sex. In the case of this woman, she couldn't even go to the doctor to have a pap smear because they couldn't insert the speculum. Not even a little teenage one, right? So the interesting part of the story is that this woman had been for 18 months to weekly 
physiotherapy sessions for her pelvic floor relaxation, and she had been to the doctor I don't know how many times, no one ever asked her about her sexual partner. Not one person. Right, so it turns out that her partner of 20 years... Oh, sorry, they don't ask you what the symbol is. <laughs> Do you think she really wants to say her sex? I know. <laughs> the partner of 20 years, and I'm sure that a lot of people would be very excited over this, was like the, the guy in the, in the shades of grey. Games all the time, blah, blah, blah. She actually didn't like, like that at all. She felt used, she felt, felt manipulated. She didn't see the fantasy world at all. She hated it. Well, having vaginismus allowed her to not have intercourse. Simple. Yet she had this emotional sort of codependency attachment as well, which meant that she hadn't left him either. So it was a bit strange. But there you go. That's a symbol in the body. So, according to me, I have about 15 minutes, 14? Okay. Who wants to, we're not going to do, go deep into this, but what I want is for all of you to hear from someone who's got a symptom, to see if you can pick up in the language and in the onset and in the symbology what it could be about. Anyone willing? So just I said, everyone, by the way, I'll tell you later, but we all have to have symptoms because are you, perf are you perfectly without conflict in your life? Yeah. Do you have no challenges? No, I have challenges. You have challenges. What about you? Do you have challenges? Yeah. Okay, therefore we all have symptoms all the time and it could be a little, little toe or it could be a headache, but we all have symptoms all the time and that's normal because we're all running stories all the time. So no shame in symptoms. Who, anyone? I have cramping in my left. Do you want to come over here sure. so we can? Sure. Actually, is there a microphone here? But we can share it. Hi everyone, I'm Jerry. Hi Jerry. Hello Jerry. Hi Jerry. I'll hold it for okay. So um, I'm 41. I used to have very bad back pain, but no more because of the type of work you do. But I still have severe cramping in my left leg and foot. It wakes me up in the okay. middle of the night. Okay. So when did that start? Uh, three years ago. And what, hap what was happening in your life three years ago? Um, a lot of career change. Um, a new relationship, um, some deaths in my family. A lot of change? Yeah, a lot of change. Okay. <coughs> um, and what, what does the cramp feel like? Can you describe what it feels like? Hmm. Uh, well, most of the time when I'm not actively cramping, it feels like uh, a flutteriness or a low-grade tension. When it's actively cramping, um, it feels like my foot and my leg are turning inward and I have to get out of bed and walk it off. It's really painful. Um, is, that, is that enough? Okay. So, question to the audience. Mm -hmm. So, he describes a fluttery feeling normally, like on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And your career cha change was from what to what? I was a chaplain in the fire department and I went full-time into my hypnotherapy practice. Is that a scary experience? It was very scary, yeah. Okay. Right, so we've got fluttery. What does fluttery remind you of? Anyone? Nervous. Nervous, butterflies in the stomach yeah. usually. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what does leg, leg mean for you? Moving forward? Okay. I don't know, but I, and I don't have all the answers, by the way, but in my hallucination, and this is often why I say to my clients, in my hallucination, this could have something to do with the fact that you had a career change and a bunch of challenges happening at the same time. The whole thing is scary, by the way, you're not the only one who went through the fear. Yeah. And sometimes it feels like a scary thing to do to embark in this new path that you are exploring you're not exactly you know when you walk a trodden path you know where you go yeah yeah that's true uh it i felt unstable since then unstable yeah okay so does this match what's going on in your life yeah cool i mean not anymore but okay. i know the programming can remain after the 
Not necessarily, because now you know what it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what do you need in order to feel stable in your new career path? Hmm. Uh, I, I just need to relax into it. Okay. And have you got all the training that you need already? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Including the business training? Uh, I could probably do with some marketing training. Huh? So yeah. maybe a little bit of that? Yeah. Okay. So you don't need the cramp anymore, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> Thank you. I'm checking it out right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So did you hear that it came out in language? Yes, that's very interesting. It came out in onset. The symbol of how do you walk a path, the instability, it all matches. This is not rocket science, guys. I can't believe it took me 15 years to get here. <laughs> Usually I can create a cramp just by pointing my toe. I'm pointing my toe as hard as I can. There's no cramp. Okay. So he says that usually he can cause a cramp by just hyperextending his foot, and he's doing it right now, and the cramp is not there anymore. Great. Right. So I only have a few minutes left, and I want to give you a chance for a few questions before I finish it off. Any questions? So is this, is this something that, uh, I mean, anybody can do, or do you need some specific training? <laughs> is this something that anybody can do? Do you need specific training? I think anybody can do this. I mean, I've just given you four questions, which forms the basis of what I do. Okay. Um, I probably have a lot of... Um, I, I have, I'm one of those people who has studied everything, like I've done Ayurveda, I've done Chinese medicine, I've done homeopathy, I've done naturopathy, I've done this and that. And so I have got a lot of tools which allow me to see behind the symbol <coughs> and where to head. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You're, you're ancients of change anyway, you're mind shifters. All you need to really get into your, into your body today is that you don't need to be scared of a physical condition because you can address the emotional conflict behind and the physical condition can go away with it. Is it, and the follow-up, is it uh, Socratic in the sense that you don't have to do any interpretation of the answers, you let the uh, patient, for lack of a better word, interpret themselves? So the question is whether I do the interpretation or the client does it well. No, I don't have the interpretation because my, my view of the world is completely different to the clients. And so we, had, we have had very interesting conversations where for me something represents something and for another person ever represents something completely different. And so I've had that happening a number of times and then when the patient, when the client comes with a word, I'm like, ah, is that what it means? Do you have a, do you have a frame that you have to deal with the patient's secondary game? Very often, so the, the question is about secondary game and yes, not everybody is willing to let go of their symptom because obviously there are advantages to it. So they have to prepare to do the change. Yes, that, that's often an obstacle. So once you've discovered, just like you did with, I'm sorry, Jerry. Jerry. Yep. With Jerry, then you just talk him through and make him realize what it was yeah. and then make him feel good about letting it. So the question was whether the discovery is enough. Right. Um, often, because Jerry's already on his path. I mean, he's, the only thing that he didn't know was that the cramp was related to his being, but now he's realized that he's got everything he needs to go forward. So he's, he already had done the work. But I mean, from your perspective, as the person helping the other person, what is it that you have to do? Like for me, if I were to help you, yeah. and I discover that... You, you, if, if, the question is, what do you do as a therapist yes. when you discover yeah. this? Well, it depends on what stage that person is. You wouldn't treat it any different to any other of your hypnotherapy clients. The beauty of this babe, is that you don't have to have, you don't need to be a specialist in cramps or a specialist in pinky pain, a specialist in knee problems, because you're not solving the, the, the symptom, you're just doing your normal hypnotherapy work. That's all you're doing. So there's no big mystery around it. I'm just going back to the knees. So if somebody had knee pain, would you check first to make sure there's not something physically grinding or, okay. or broken? So the question is whether um, if somebody has knee pain, whether we need to check whether there's something <coughs> physical, anatomical going on. The, the, the answer to that is very, the fact that there is a mind-body connection doesn't mean that it's not physical. It will always be physical. I had an ankle pain with changes in the cartilage 
that completely went away, even though the changes were degenerative, they're supposed to progress, it's gone because I resolved the conflict that was behind it. It was very similar to unitary, by the way. So, at knees, just to wrap it up, knees are very often about what's your next move as well. So going forward, loosening the fear behind, behind going forward. Okay. And the fact that it's physical, doesn't mean, it means that you have to go, listen, I see people with, with cancer, I see people with lupus, with rheumatoid arthritis, they all have physical changes because when there's a change here, it goes down through molecules. And, and the manifestation in the physical world is anatomical, it's just that if you catch it early, then you only have symptoms. If you catch it a little bit further on, there's already anatomical changes. To what point is this reversible? That's a good question. And it probably depends on the amount of scarring. So it depends on the condition and the amount of scarring. Scars are usually very difficult to remove. But things like cancers, there's no reason why it shouldn't go away once the pattern that lies behind it is resolved. Many times you get rid of the suggestion, I personally was crippled little finger through arthritis. They said there's no cure for that. Yeah. Within a year, the normal again. So, yeah, so yeah. Carmen's saying that that little finger cripple was, he was told that it was no way that would resolve. And it went. I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's supposed to be incurable. And it disappeared. I didn't even, didn't even think of it. I had it in my 20s, and then in my, my 30s, I realized I didn't have it anymore. I was supposed to take thyroxine for the rest of my life. So there's, you know, it's about opening the minds of yourselves, the clients, the world. We don't need to address it directly because the medical world will go, oh! Um, and funnily enough, I have talked about this to doctors, and the doctors in the room, the old ones, would come to me and say, you're so right, I've seen it all my life in my career. The young ones are like, ooh, what are you talking about? <laughs> so it's really a matter of experience, and the more you open your eyes and the more aware you are, the more you realize that this is, and, and seriously now, I have no doubt this is the case. So I just want to wrap it up with this idea. If you have symptoms, embrace them. Because those symptoms are the physical manifestation, the symbol that expresses what's going on for you as a conflict, something that is your challenge for you to grow bigger and better as people, you know, in the, in the material world and spiritually. So every time I have, I have a symptom person, you know, just sit with it. What does this mean? And then I take action, and I often don't know what it means. I often take a conversation with someone else to know what it means in me, but then I, I, I take the action in order to resolve it. So imagine that your symptom is a bit like a guide who's taking you into your emotional life for you to examine and see what's next. But this guide can't speak. So it starts doing charades for you. So it gives you a, you know, a cramp. Hey, it's about walking this path, right? Or it, it, it comes up with some other symbol as a way of expressing. So unfortunately, it can't talk. But imagine it's a game of charades and have fun with it. Explore it. I haven't taken medication for like 12 years. <laughs> and I've, 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 I change from one symptom, I resolve that one, and in comes the next one. And so that's my next challenge and so on. It's great. Because I have a lot of therapist friends who are ashamed because they, they themselves are ill with something. No, it's part of the process. We're all growing. And if your story inside is that you're, you're growing, struggling for something, then necessarily that has to manifest in your body. That's all right. We all do this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.